Chapter 5. A Further Difficulty in Naturalism Even as rigorous a determinist as Karl Marx, who at times described the social behavior of the bourgeoisie in terms which suggested a problem in social physics, could subject it at other times to a withering scorn which only the presupposition of moral responsibility could justify. R. Niebuhr, An, Inter in An Interpretation of Christian Ethics, Chapter 3 Some people regard logical thinking as the deadest and driest of our activities and may therefore be repelled by the privileged position I gave it in the last chapter. But logical thinking, reasoning, had to be the pivot of the argument because of all the claims which the human mind puts forward, the claim of reasoning to be valid is the only one which the naturalist cannot deny without, philosophically speaking, cutting his own throat. You cannot, as we saw, prove that there are no proofs, but you can, if you wish, regard all human ideals as illusions and all human loves as biological byproducts. That is, you can do so without running into sat flat self-contradiction and nonsense, whether you can do so without extreme unplausibility, without accepting a picture of things which no one really believes, is another matter. Besides reasoning about matters of fact, men also make moral judgments. I ought to do this. I ought not to do that. This is good. That is evil. Two views have been held about moral judgments. Some people think that when we make them, we are not using our reason, but are employing some different power. Other people think that we make them by our own reason. I myself hold this second view. That is, I believe that the primary moral principles on which all others depend are rationally perceived. We just see that there is no reason why my neighbor's happiness should be sacrificed to my own, as we just see that things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. If we cannot prove either axiom, that is, not because they are irrational, but because they are self-evident and all proofs depend on them, their intrinsic reasonableness shines by its own light. It is because all moral morality is based on such self-evident principles that we say to a man when we would recall him to right conduct, be reasonable. You can see this chapter is going to focus on, um, he calls it a further difficulty in naturalism, because... The first difficulty he sees in naturalism is that that uh, reasoning itself, if it's to be held up to the privileged position that it needs to have in order to uh, make assertions and draw conclusions that are valid, that aren't dependent on cause and effect, um, um, that aren't dependent on cause and effect, naturalism, strict naturalism, uh, can't be the source of it can't be the source of reasoning. That's the first difficulty with naturalism. You remember from that chapter called The Cardinal Difficulty of Naturalism. In this chapter, he's dealing with the difficulty, another difficulty of naturalism, which is, well, what about morals? Okay, we've got, we've got our, our, our problem with uh, naturalism that, that looks at reasoning and says, well, um, it's, it can't be, pl uh, the naturalists would, would say reasoning isn't in any privileged position, it's just another thing that that is uh, in the cause and effect chain, while the naturalist excludes the reasoning he was using at the moment he came to that conclusion, mm -hmm. right? So that that's that that difficulty. But then, what about all of these? What about all of this uh, human um, engagement in moral reasoning? We also because we also engage in morals. We say what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. Uh, what about all of that? Where does all of that come from? Um, this is this. We get up out of bed. W right, right. Well, and y you know. As he, this chapter is it as it pains to to discuss. You could just dismiss all of that and say, well, that's just that's just humans lying to themselves, you know, all of that reasoning. But we throw out a lot when we do that because there are, there are, um, the the uh, amount of of time time and energy that humans have invested in reasoning about morality, writing novels about morality, writing stories that tell a lesson. Uh, um, dying for morality, dying for what's what they perceived to be right or what they perceived to be wrong, uh, it takes up a tremendous amount of human history. And most people uh, who have earned the right to be listened to have felt that those were the the crowning achievements of humanity. So we're throwing out a lot if we choose to throw it out. And he says there's two views that have have prevailed 
about where, uh, what we're doing when we're exercising moral reasoning. One is that we're exercising some different power, some power that, uh, that uh, isn't our own. Um, and another, another one, the one Lewis adopts, says that power is our own. We are exercising our own reasoning when we're reasoning about morals. In other words, we're, we're seeing morals as rational. Right? We're, we're understanding that uh, when we say that we respect an, uh, another man's right to exist, when we, as he pointed out, when we see that uh, our neighbor's interest should not be sacrificed to my own, that's not something I can. That's not something I can lay down an argument for. I just see that it must be so. Just as I see that it must be so that two things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. That's not something I can. I can lay out an argument for, because it's it's so, it's, obvious. It's so obvious, right? It's so uh, self-evident. Um, all and as he said, it, it, that doesn't mean that they're not true, uh, because I can't lay out an argument for them. It just means that all proofs are dependent on them. They are foundational. You can't drill down any deeper. This is the rock. This is the bedrock. This is the the foundation of of uh, other proofs. But this is, by the way, for our present purpose, it does not matter which of these two views you adopt. The important point is to notice that moral judgments raise the same sort of difficulty for naturalism as any other thoughts. We always assume in discussions about morality, as in all other discussions that the other man's views are worthless if they can be fully accounted for by some non-moral and non-rational cause. You remember this argument, right? Mm -hmm. When two men differ about good and evil, we soon hear this principle being brought into play. Quote, he believes in the sanctity of property because he's a millionaire. He believes in pacifism because he's a coward. He approves of corporal punishment because he's a sadist. End quote. Such taunts may often be untrue, but the mere fact that they are made by the one side and hotly rebutted by the other shows clearly what principle is being used. Neither side doubts that if they were true, they would be decisive. No one, in real life, pays attention to any moral judgment which can be shown to spring from non-moral and non-rational causes. The Freudian and the Marxist attack traditional morality precisely on this ground, and with wide success. All men except the principal. This is this is our this is our football example again. If if it can be shown that your belief about one player's su uh, superiority to all others is purely based on the fact that you're a fan of that player's team, what good is your what good is your assertion? What good is your claim? Nobody nobody lends any credibility to it. Same with moral judgments. Well, you only you only believe in the sanctity in the examples he gave, or you know you only believe in the sanctity of capitalism and property because you're a millionaire. Of course, that would suit your interests, wouldn't it? Right? That to have to have all of that sanctity for private property ensconced and and enshrined in the law. Of course, that would suit your purposes. You have a bunch of property. So if that were true, if that were true, that the only reason this person believed in the sanctity of private property was because he was a millionaire. Well, that would remove the credibility of his claim about the sanctity of property. It would remove, we wouldn't have to deal with the, the uh, grounds of his argument because the grounds of his argument are self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. it's, the same, it's the same with um, these other ones he uses. He said he believes in pacifism because he's a coward. He doesn't actually philosophically, morally believe in pacifism. He's just afraid to die or afraid of pain. Or afraid of conflict, or who, the other, the million other horrors that war offers. Uh, the other one is he approves of corporal punishment because he's a sadist. Well, he, of course, you like the fact that people are punished physically, you know, beaten with a rod or 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 executed. You like that stuff because you get physical, you get sexual pleasure from seeing other people suffer. Well, these would remove the credibility of people's arguments if these things were true. So and we and we we behave like that in dispute disputation. We <clears throat> we we if someone uh, makes a claim like this about our about our uh, our stance, we rebut it, and we dig in our heels and say that's not true. I believe this because, and then go on to make our case. Uh, you know, he brings up Marx here, and he brings up Fro uh, Freud, and he says Freud and Marx make claims just like this, and and do it with 
uh, about traditional morality and do it with a lot of success. Uh, Freud and Marx both claimed that a lot of the morals that that um, that are uh, traditional, that are um, uh, accepted by everybody, are uh, products of um, environment. They were products of of, uh, of social circumstances, uh, rather than rather than uh, actually true. You know, true outs whether humans believe them or not, they would be true. They they rejected that kind of truth in morality, and said, well. For instance, uh, Marx would say, "Well, you, you know, the uh, the the um, um, morals that prevail today in our society are because of the social situation in which we live, not necessarily because they're true." Um, Freud, Freud would say the same thing about sexual mores. You know, they're 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 the they're um, 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 they prevail on men's minds. They prevail on women's minds because of the society in which we live. And, and that society represses the sexuality that's really there and is actually neither good nor bad. It just is there. So, uh, going back to Lewis here, he says, But of course, what discredits particular moral judgments must equally discredit moral judgments as a whole. If the fact that men have such ideas as ought and ought not at all can be fully explained by irrational and non-moral causes, then those ideas are an illusion. The naturalist is ready to explain how the illusion arose. Chemical conditions produce life. Life, under the influence of natural selection, produces consciousness. Conscious organisms which behave in one way live longer than those which behave in another. So this is sort of the utilitarian, pragmatic view of things here. Living longer, they are more likely to have offspring. Inheritance, and sometimes teaching as well, pass on their mode of behavior to their young. Thus, in every species, a pattern of behavior is built up. In the human species, conscious teaching plays a larger part in building it up, and the tribe further strengthens it by killing individuals who don't conform. They also invent gods who are said to punish departures from it. Thus, in time, there comes to exist a strong human impulse to conform. But since this impulse is often at variance with the other impulses, a mental conflict arises, and the man expresses it by saying, Quote, I want to do A, but I ought to do B, end quote. This account may, or may not, explain why men do, in fact, make moral judgments. It does not explain, excuse me, it does not explain how they could be right in making them. It excludes, indeed, the very possibility of their being right. For when men say, I ought, they certainly think they are saying something, and something true, about the nature of the proposed action, and not merely about their own feelings. But if naturalism is true, I ought is the same sort of statement as I itch or I'm going to be sick. In real life, when a man says I ought, we may reply, yes, you're right. That is what you ought to do, or else, no, I think you're mistaken. But in a world of naturalists, if naturalists really remember their philosophy out of school, the only sensible reply would be, oh, are you? All moral judgments would be statements about the speaker's feelings, mistaken by him for statements about something else, the real moral quality of actions, which does not exist. So, the, uh, the naturalist has a problem with, with making moral judgments, in that when the moral judgments, when, when he uses the traditional language, you know, the I ought to do this, I want to do this, but I ought to do that, those, that sort of uh, moral language uh, really loses its its punch, its punch, its its muster, its its effect, because by adopting the naturalist position, if we reason from the naturalist perspective, a feeling is a weird thing to say. A feeling is well, it is a weird thing to say to say if we reason from the naturalist perspective, because in a previous chapter, Lewis has really discredited the ability of naturalists to reason at all. But notwithstanding that problem, if we reason from the naturalist perspective, what we're saying is that um, we may still be using the traditional language of morality, the I ought to do this, or uh, it's right to do that. But what we're really talking about is a feeling. We're not talking about any rational, um, not if we're being intellectually honest, we're not talking about any rational um, 
well, any thought out purpose for action, for moral action. We're just talking about a feeling. Uh, Lewis equates it to saying, he equates saying I ought to do something to saying something like I itch. And the proper response to someone saying I ought to do something in this case wouldn't be, no, I don't think that's right, or yes, I think you ought to do that. It would be, oh, are you? Like if someone said, I feel sick, or I'm sick, oh, are you? That's the proper response, because that's a state, uh, the, the, a moral statement is a statement about your state of being rather than a rational judgment. Because a rational judgment is something you can respond to with an agreement or a disagreement. But you can't disagree with somebody itching. You can't disagree with somebody being ill. Your only, your only response to them can be a, a comment about their state of being. So, I'm cold. Oh, you are? It's too hot in here. I feel hot. Oh, okay. You can't really say, no, you're not. Or, yeah, I agree, you're too hot. And it's not the kind of thing that, that allows for a yes or no uh, paradigm. Well, maybe you could, but then you'd be, you'd be a jerk at that point. Right? Well, yeah, it would be nonsensical. No, you're, not. you're not hot. Settle down up there. Yeah. <laughs> nobody would know how. Nobody know, would know how to take that because it's, <laughs> it's, that's not the that's not the dynamic that that presents itself when someone makes a statement about their state of being. Uh, so morals get put into that category. Moral comments get put into that category if the naturalist uh, position is accepted. Morals and statements about morals are really statements about how you feel, not necessarily the way things are. So Lewis goes on here, Such a doctrine, I have admitted, is not flatly self-contradictory. The naturalist can, if he chooses, brazen it out. He can say, quote, I guess I quite agree that there is no such thing as right and wrong. I admit that no moral judgment can be true or correct, and yet, and consequently, that no one system of morality can be better or worse than another. All ideas of good and evil are hallucinations, shadows cast on the outer world by the impulses which we have been conditioned to feel. End quote. Indeed, many naturalists are delighted to say this. But then they must stick to it. And fortunately, though inconsistently, most real naturalists do not. Now, Lewis says fortunately, because if anybody did actually believe that and stick to it, they would be really terrible people to be around. Mm. A moment after they have admitted that good and evil are illusions, you will find them exhorting us to work for posterity, to educate, revolutionize, liquidate, live and die for the good of the human race. These, are very, uh, this, these have very Marxist flavors to them, don't they? A naturalist like Mr. H.G. Wells spent a long life doing so with passionate eloquence and zeal. But surely this is very odd. Just as all the books about spiral nebulae, atoms, and cavemen would really have led you to suppose that the naturalist claimed to be able to know something, so all the books in which naturalists tell us what we ought to do would really make you believe that they thought some ideas of good, their own for example, to be somehow preferable to others. For they write with indignation like men proclaiming what is good in itself and denouncing what is evil in itself, and not at all like men recording that they personally like mild beer, but some people prefer bitter. Yet if the oughts of Mr. Wells and, say, Franco, are both equally the impulses which nature has conditioned each to have, and both tell us nothing about any objective right or wrong, whence is all the fervor? Do they remember, while they are writing thus, that when they tell us we ought to make a better world, the words ought and better must, on their own showing, refer to an irrationally conditioned impulse which cannot be true or false any more than a vomit or a yawn. So you have, you have a, uh, a naturalist in a difficult position. All, all morals are just as... Are just as uh, a ridiculous as any other set. So one set of morals is as ridiculous as any other set because all are, all are, uh, 
conditioned responses, uh, socially constructed ideas. Uh, and then the, uh, right after the, the naturalist says something like this, and he uses H.G. Wells, uh, the novelist, and uh, Franco, the dictator in Spain, as examples, that right after they've said something like this, then they'll go on to exhort us or encourage us to work for the common good or to... to uh, They're trying to convince us in the first place. With morals. We're, they're doing it with moral reasoning. They're doing it with reasoning that tries to use moral weight to prevail on our consciousness, on our sense of, of, uh, of mission, of purpose. Uh, we ought to work for posterity. Um, you, you know, th this is something that, a modern example of this, and you know, I don't personally know his philosophy, or excuse me, I don't know his personal philosophy, but Elon Musk is a person who, who works very hard uh, at working for the future of posterity. Musk feels like it increases the likelihood that humanity will go on if we're a two-planet species. If we have um, um, colonies littered throughout um, the universe that aren't just dependent on this planet. And uh, this gives him some kind of comfort. Now he's he's uh, this could be an example of someone who is who is um, leaning on um, comments, leaning on uh, a moral framework that holds humanity's existence, humanity's continuation as its highest good, um, as a as a purpose for being and existing. Now, again, I don't know his personal moral philosophy but there are many who who uh, who do just this very thing they'll they'll say in their books about philosophy that that uh, moral reasoning is 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 nonsense and it's really just an illusion um, and then in their political life they'll uh, they'll advocate for the cessation of a war or the the uh, They'll they'll advocate for how horrible some some genocide that's being committed in some country is. Uh, they'll they'll um, um, get on the side of some political issue and do so with moral weight behind their words. And you can see that in the very first quote of this chapter, the quote that leads the chapter. Um, even as rigorous a determinist as Karl Marx who at times described the social behavior of the bourgeoisie in terms which suggested a problem in social physics, could subject it at other times to a withering scorn which only the presupposition of moral responsibility could justify. So Marx looked at the bourgeoisie with their wealth and their, their uh, in his mind, oppressive nature, keeping down the, the mass of mankind for their own, their own aggrandizement, their own pleasure, their own wealth. Uh, he looked at them and saw their saw their situation as a problem with social physics, um, but at other times he would level both barrels and fire several times with moral indignation. How could they treat people this way? Uh, so you've got it. in in one sense he's he's uh, leaning on that portion of his philosophy that says morals are really just an illusion. And another time, he's leaning very, very heavily on that that irrational position that morals are actually something transcendent, that there is rationality to them, and he feels the moral weight of that, and wants you to also. Yeah, so th that's that's why that's why he begins with this uh, the chapter with this quote because it's it's. Uh, these are, these are really inconsistent positions. You can't you can't say that morals have no weight and then at in the next breath encourage me to fight for humanity or to to consider some goal as um, estimable. These aren't these aren't these aren't compatible ideas. This is why you know he he compares them here at the end of this paragraph to bodily functions. Lewis says. Do they remember while they are writing in this way or writing thus that they that when they tell us we ought to make a better world, 
The words ought and better must, on their own showing, refer to an irrationally conditioned impulse, which cannot be true or false any more than a vomit or a yawn. Vomits and yawns aren't true or false, they merely are. Just like when you say, I feel cold or hot. This isn't something which can be disagreed with. This isn't something which is, a prop is propositional. It's just a statement of being. My idea is that sometimes they do forget, Lewis says. That is their glory. He's glad about this. He's glad they forget. Because if they didn't, what insufferable, horrible people they would be. If they really believed that morals were just sensations and not actually something that compelled behavior. Holding a philosophy which excludes humanity, they yet remain human. At the sight of injustice, they throw all their naturalism in the winds and speak like men and like men of genius. They know far better than they think they know. But at other times, I suspect they are trusting in a supposed way of escape from their difficulty. It works, or seems to work, like this. They say to themselves, quote, Ah, yes, morality or bourgeois morality, or conventional morality, or traditional morality, or some such addition. Morality is an illusion, they say. But we have found out what modes of behavior will in fact preserve the human race alive. That is the behavior we are pressing you to adopt. Pray, don't mistake us for moralists. We are under an entirely new management, end quote. Just as if this would help. It would help only if we grant, firstly, that life is better than death, and secondly, that we ought to care for the lives of our descendants as much as, or more than, for our own. And both these are moral judgments which have, like all others, been explained away by naturalism. Of course, having been conditioned by nature in a certain way, we do feel thus about life and about posterity, but the naturalists have cured us of mistaking these feelings for insights into what we once called real value. Now that I know that my impulse to serve posterity is just the same kind of thing as my fondness for cheese, now that its transcendental pretensions have been exposed for a sham, do you think I shall pay much attention to it? When it happens to be strong, and it has grown considerably weaker since you explained it to me, it's explained to me its real nature, I suppose I shall obey it. When it is weak, I shall put my money into cheese. There can be no reason for trying to whip up and encourage one impulse rather than the other, not now that I know what they both are. The naturalist must not destroy all my reverence for conscience on Monday and expect to find me still venerating it on Tuesday. So you can imagine the moralist saying, the, the, or excuse me, the rationalist saying this, uh, Oh, oh! You've noticed an inconsistency. You've noticed that 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 we at sometimes denigrate morality as as meaningless and illusionary, uh, or illusory, and then at other times you notice us using words and engaging in moral disputations about some tragedy in the world or some some uh, some uh, uh, purpose that we feel humanity should be striving toward. <laughs> Don't mistake us for moralists here. That's really not our motivation. Our motivation is that over time, humanity has discovered that this one mode of behavior is tends t toward the survival of the human race more than others do. That's really what we're talking about here. Yes, we're using moral language, but that's really just because of the world we live in and the traditions that have been built up. We don't actually believe in things being moral or amoral. We just know that this mode of behavior is more likely to promote the survival of the human race than some other mode of behavior. And that's why we're encouraging it. I, I can see where you came to that mistake, seeing us as moral creatures. We're, we're really just pragmatists here, right? We're really just utilitarians. So, you know, let's, let's disabuse you of those ideas, but Lewis is like, hey, as if this would help. Uh, you, you could take this position. You could, you could say, well, you know, we're just, we're just in a, trying to promote what we've what humanity over millions of years has discovered tends to promote its own survival but this would only this would only have some some weight if we granted the position that the that life is better than death because you're trying to promote the survival of the human species and that the survival of the human species matters that and and also that we should that we should value the lives of our of posterity the people that will come after us 
maybe thousands of years after us, as much or more than we value our own. So this won't do. It won't do to say we're just trying to promote humanity's survival because that's one moral that's one more moral judgment. That's all it is. And you've already as the naturalist you've already disabused us of our veneration for morals. So we can't you can't uh completely remove the the uh substance of moral reasoning and then expect us to be okay with yet one more moral reason in this case it's the promotion and survival of the human species as if that is better than something else lewis says you've already told me that my moral feelings my moral inclinations that's a better word are a are the same kind of thing as my fondness for cheese now, uh, you can't expect me to keep venerating my, my morals when I know that they're in this same category as my fondness for cheese. When my morals are strong, and you know, I find them being weaker, if I find them they've grown considerably weaker since you started telling me about this, naturalist. Great. But when they're not so strong, I'll put my money in cheese. Because they're the same thing. They're equivalent. There is no escape along those lines, Lewis continues. If we are to continue to make moral judgments, and whatever we say we shall in fact continue, then we must believe that the conscience of man is not a product of nature. It can be valid only if it is an offshoot of some absolute moral wisdom, a moral wisdom which exists absolutely on its own, and is not a product of non-moral, non-rational nature. As the argument of the last chapter led us to acknowledge a supernatural source for rational thought, so the argument of this leads us to acknowledge a supernatural source for our ideas of good and evil. In other words, we now know something more about God. If you hold that moral judgment is a different thing from reasoning, you will express this new knowledge by saying, we now know that God has at least one other attribute than rationality. If, like me, you hold that moral judgment is a kind of reasoning, then you will say, we now know more about the divine reason. And with this, we are almost ready to begin our main argument. But before doing so, it will be well to pause for the consideration of some misgivings or misunderstandings which may have already arisen. If you are enjoying this style of content at Just Conversations, please subscribe. Share this video and leave a like or a comment.